If you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. We all watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange? There were no fighter jets. Did someone give the order not to intercept? And if they really scrambled, then why'd they fly so slow? Maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know. And where was our president, George W. That fool? He was visiting with children at an elementary school. And when he heard the news, he didn't seem concerned. He just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned. The Bushes and Bin Ladens. Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded, they flew his family out. Osama got his training from the CIA. Our soldiers took Afghanistan, they let him slip away. A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? If you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. Welcome to another episode of Omega Presents, August 2nd, 2008. Yeah, that was a great video. John Kellerman composed the song and performed it, and Jim Rathall, one of our PCM producers here, did the video for that show. I always show that in its complete form there. We're going to have a lot of uh, stuff to tell you today. I'm going to have the breaking news I promised last time. Um, with an interview with Kevin Ryan by Alex Jones. And that brings up another subject. Uh, I've received an email from a fellow in England. You know, I put my show on Google and that 
lets people have the chance to watch it from anywhere. So I want to bring up the point right now. If you're watching my show from anywhere but Portland, even Portland, I don't care, write me an email. Tell me where you're watching it from and what you think about it. Um, I was pleased to get the email from a guy named John Lamas. I think I pronounced his name right, from England. And uh, he said he liked my show, and but he also thought that I and others uh, worship Alex Jones like a god too much. And uh, I'll, you know, I'll state for the record, I've got plenty of reservations about Alex Jones. He, you know, sensationalizes an awful lot and links things that don't need to be linked, and he does it a lot for uh, the sake of his show. And I don't blame him, but he's still, you know, now he's one of the most popular. Uh, sources on the internet and as such he draws a great group of people to interview Kevin Ryan just happened to be one of them and so I'm gonna play that interview even though it you know it's from Alex Jones but uh, John Lamas said to investigate Bill Cooper a, a fellow who was killed by the sheriff's department in England um, back in 2000 or 2001 he had predicted the 9-11 attack but his main thing was UFOs, I guess. But uh, this email from England suggested that I do some research on that, and I started looking into it. And what I saw was that a little, I didn't, I'm not very complete on my investigation, but I did notice that uh, the goods that he had on Alex Jones at the time were mainly about Y2K. And I, I have to agree exactly with what William Cooper was saying, that it was all hype and sensationalism. And, and scare tactics that Alex Jones was putting out because after nine or whatever 2K 911 9 2K I'm getting all tongue tied but anyway after the 2000 date came and went uh, we saw that there wasn't a big problem and that it was sensationalism and there's a certain amount of that in what Alex is doing now but it's still a great source if the guys have it set up in there I, I want to roll the clip that uh, shows that Kevin Ryan don't ever fire a scientist that's doing his job and especially don't fire an honest one because he made it his business after he was fired by the underwriters laboratories to uh, research more into this 9-11 stuff and he's nailed down where the thermate came from the controlled demolition product that helped bring down the towers so if they're ready to roll I'm ready to turn it over to the DVD player let's the debate's over. 9-11 is a inside job. Bottom line, I discovered many years ago that it was declassified, admitted, not debated, that criminal elements of our government at the highest levels have staged hundreds of terror attacks in foreign countries to blame it on their enemies as a pretext of war. And so when I saw the government bomb the Oklahoma City building, when I saw them cook the bomb, train the drivers, provocateur of the first World Trade Center attack, when I saw them getting us hyped up before 9-11, I went on air and I said, look out, they're going to hit the towers. And they did, in a big way. Kevin Ryan, a uh, member of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, the founder, also Richard Gage with us. Kevin, get back more into tracing back thermate, explosive accelerants, thermate, uh, this explosive type of thermite, getting down into nano-sized particulates, the residue found in multiple, uh, multiple samples there, and then you look at who's doing the investigation, who's doing the cover-up, and it's top experts in explosive thermite. Spend the last few minutes on that for us, please, sir. Okay, great. Yeah, the, uh, the thermite that I'm most interested in is, um, is uh, uh, sprayable. It's a material that was developed by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and uh, and and they clearly make it uh, stated that they can spray this on surfaces, and so that relates to the question of how the floors in the uh, World Trade Center um, that were impacted and had fires in them just happened to match up exactly with the floors of fireproofing upgrade in 1999 and so forth. Well, in 1999, these scientists at Lawrence Livermore Nas National Lab performed experiments on these energetic nanocomposites at NIST. So then, you know, that leads you to the question of how, how NIST has responded to questions about thermite. They've actually acted like, oh, they never heard of it before. You know, we never tested for it. We just never imagined that was a possibility. Um, but, of course, that's absurd when you look at Foreman Williams, their leading engineer in their advisory committee and so forth. But if you look at their, their top directors as well, there was Arden Beeman, 
who was uh, nominated by George W. Bush in, in October of 2001, the month after the events, and, and became the director of NIST shortly thereafter, is an interesting choice. He was a deputy secret, for, former deputy secretary of defense and a former director of DARPA's Office of Material Science and a former executive at TRW. TRW is a military contractor that is involved in creating gelant materials for energetic nanocomposites. He's also connected to very interesting organizations like Battelle. You've probably heard of Battelle, but um, they are an organization that manages the five national laboratories uh, for the Department of Energy. So um, the Lord Corporation, he's a director of, they make coatings, high-tech coatings. Um, there's the connections um, between this guy and the possibilities of what happened at the World Trade Center are extensive. Then we have a, a second director uh, nominated after Beeman leaves in, in November of 2004, and this is Harach Samergian. Um, and this is a guy who was the director of NIST chemical division for years and, and actually wrote 10 papers with, uh, with the world's leading expert on energetic nanocomposites. Uh, just, you know, the connection is, is too clear. And I don't mean to uh, make myself clear. I don't mean to come out and accuse these people today, but I'm just saying that these connections are too clear and too coincidental. Um, if, you know, you're nominating people who just happen to have all this experience in what is ultimately being found to be a culprit in the event. You have an incredibly specific and rare science with probably only a few hundred right. people in the world or less that are right. experts, and you don't just have some of the experts. You have the fathers of these weapon systems uh, who are minions of Bush, pro-war hawks, magically running the investigation and then laughing at you saying thermite what thermite is an accelerant thermite to burn down buildings thermate you know acting like you're a kook and then it turns out they're the masters of it right absolutely i mean that's absurd right and if you look at all the other stop contracts. stop you know what this is too important i got another guest kevin booth coming up but i want to back him up 10 minutes can you guys do 10 more minutes sure now, this bet. is this is too important i want to come back and finish up with this come back and finish up with this you have all right final segment with engineer kevin ryan who worked in underwriting laboratories discovered they had reports they were suppressing about the fact that those fires wouldn't have brought down the towers much less building seven he got fired over that over speaking out and of course we have richard gage who is an architect builds uh, large buildings he looked at the evidence, couldn't believe it. He's got over 400 architects, engineers now part of his group. Before we go any further, men, both give out websites you think are important for people to visit. Well, well you could start with uh, AE911truth.org. That's www.AE911truth.org. And then Kevin's got a, a great yeah. website at Scholars. Yeah, we've got a, a Scholars website, stj911.com. We've got the Journal of 911studies.com, Journal of 911studies.com. I've contributed to a book that's coming out again here shortly. It's called The, the Hidden History of 911. The editor is Paul Zaremka, uh, where I talk about uh, some of the science involved in uh, and uh, some of the debunking that, that went on. Um, what other websites? I think that should do it. And of course, Jim Hoffman's website is excellent as well, WTC7.net. Absolutely. Great website. Now, continue, Kevin Ryan, with you were getting into another one of these engineers involved in the NIST chicanery and his connections. So we, well, we went through Foreman Williams, the lead engineer in the advisory committee. Went through uh, the directors Beement and Samergian. We talked about uh, SAIC, uh, which is the Science Application International Corporation, and they have connections to thermite, and they were uh, the uh, uh, largest contingent on the NIST investigation outside of the government employees. They have a, a, a company called Applied Ordnance Technology that does research on energetic nanocomposites. And they also um, were involved in contracts um, coordinated by um, a company, not a company, but a, a, a military organization called the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Indian Head in 1999 to 2000. Um, 
and they are a creator. They're actually a, a manufacturer of the materials needed for energetic nanocomposites. So, you know, the, there's a lot of connections here. Uh, I think you can go to the 9-11 Commission and you see some really interesting com uh, connections. You see John Lehman, who's the uh, was a 9-11 commissioner, former secretary of the Navy, and he just decided to buy a company called Special Devices in, in 1998 and then divest in 2001. This is a company that makes explosives for spacecraft, uh, very interesting types of explosives. So one thing I would say is that uh, energetic nanocomposites and thermite materials are only part of the story at the World Trade Center. There clearly were other explosives. Are those special explosive bolts for uh, emergency exits right. on, on spacecraft? Right, separation joint materials. Uh, uh, shape charges for for explosives on you know the the average spacecraft has a, a great deal of pyrotechnic charges going off throughout its mission uh, and just to make sure that popular mechanics knows if they're listening there's no need to to run wiring between Cape Canaveral and Mars to make that happen um, but I think the space connections are that's are, right they're always saying there has to be wiring in the building. For explosives, uh, right? I mean, just unbelievable little creatures. But they're the fathers of yellow journalism. They know what they're doing. Despicable people. Now let's go back here. You got into something that I think should be a major headline. Uh, I mean, you just brought up one of these guys with a company that makes the, you know, high tech, uh, thermate nano uh, uh, materials. But earlier, you were talking about the installation by a company connected to all of this of quote new. Fireproofing in '99. Let's go back to that. Yeah, it's, I've got a, uh, a paper that I wrote called "Another Amazing Coincidence at the World Trade Center," and it shows how um, the floors that were upgraded for fireproofing and the towers matched almost exactly with the floors where uh, the planes impacted, and that the, the fires, which shouldn't have been there for so long, actually occurred. Um, and so when, then we go into uh, looking at the NIST report that uh, talks about this, and, and there were some reports mentioned that aren't available to the public. One was made by a company called Burrow Happold, an engineering consultant from England. They did an investigation of these fireproofing upgrades and, and to, as they were going on, as they were starting, and they were suggesting the use of, quote, alternative materials. So uh, let's just speculate on the, uh, the possibilities for how this could happen. You know, thermitic materials applied underneath fireproofing would work just as well as, as if they were applied, uh, you know, without fireproofing. And let's not forget, this building had the CIA, the FBI, Defense Intelligence. It was all government. This was the most uh, spooked out building anywhere because you had them all together in one building. Yeah, in World Trade Center 7. So if they were using alternative materials for fireproofing, they might use something, uh, for example, intumescent paint is, is something that would be used for Okay, we're back again. I just, you know, we can go on and on with that. And you can go to the Alex Jones website yourself, uh, prisonplanet.tv, and, and check into that. It's about a 45-minute interview. The whole thing is really worth listening to. Now we're going to get on to the, the next subject. I've got Barbara and Barry here from the 9-11, or PDX 9-11 Truth Group Alliance. Alliance. Alliance, mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I'm going to turn the show over to them. They have prepared a uh, talk about? Well, we're going to talk about the psychology, sociology of rejection. Yeah, why don't you guys do something with all this information you're getting? That's, <laughs> that's what we're going to be talking about. So enjoy the show. Barry and Barbara, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Well, Barbara and I are considered 9-11 uh, uh, scholars, and we've been working closely together, and today we want to share something really special. First thing I want to do, Barbara, yeah. is to read a little quote. He who dominates over you has only two eyes, only two hands, only one body, no more than is possessed by the least among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer on him to destroy you. How has he acquired enough eyes to spy on you if you do not provide them yourselves? How can he have so many arms to beat you with if he doesn't borrow them from you? The feet that trample down your cities, where does he get them if not your own? How does he have any power over you except through you? 
What could he do if you yourselves did not convive with the thief who plunders you, if you were not accomplices of the murderer who kills you, if you were not traitors to yourselves? How we do enter into our own demise. This was a quote by Etienne de la Poti, a political ph philosopher in 1552, Old Truth, Newly Applied. Rudolf Steiner said in a magical sleight of hand to spread untruth through the world in such a way that it works as truth, when he said in 1917, this effect of truth, untruth as truth contains an enormous force of evil. And this force of evil is made full use of in various ways by different interests. T.H. Meyer, a Swiss scholar who writes about 9-11, basically an outsider from Europe sees very clearly, as Europeans do about 9-11, the truth of what's happening to us. And he said, how will the mass population of America regard their government once they have awakened from their illusion. Wow. Barry Zwicker, in his opening statements of Towers of Deception, says 9-11 is the biggest Achilles heel of modern history. And later he refers to it as the linchpin to all that is wrong in the world today. And I'm quoting him here, realizing the fraud of 9-11 is, in my opinion, the most important task facing civilization today. You agree with that? I do. What do you, the public, think about the gravity of that statement? That's the real important issue for today. You've been confronted with the truth of 9-11 on this program many times before by your host, Bill Olson. Evidence upon evidence and truth has been continually presented to you in the history of this program and in many other places. But guess what, public? Two things stick out to you today. No, this is not 2001. It's 2008, seven years later. Yeah. And secondly, you've had seven years then to respond to do something about the truth of 9-11, right? That's what I would say today. We will turn the tables on the usual script of this program. Instead of presenting evidence that you, the public, should have already seen, researched, and done something about, you're going to have to assume the role of those guilty and complicit with the perpetrators who did 9-11. Because you are in large mass of those who have not been receptive to the truth of 9-11. You have been one of at least a number of groups doing nothing, like Nazi Germans gone on with your lives without doing anything productive about 9-11. You're really one of four groups First group is, in part, those who passively walk away from the evidence and don't think. We know right. people like that? Yeah. <clears throat> There's another group who passively walk away from the evidence while thinking about it, don't do anything about it, right? Absolutely. Right. There's a third group who think about it, are threatened with the evidence, and attack the message of the truth of 9-11. Absolutely. And then there's this fourth group, those who think about it and immediately get angry and attack the messengers of 9-11. Right, that's happened. So we have yeah. a whole spectrum of groups. In other words, this program will move from the question of why don't you look at the evidence of 9-11 as an inside job or a black op to why you don't. But we don't mean this to be destructive. We want people on the program who hear this program today to understand reasons why they don't take in 9-11. There are really definitive reasons, aren't there? There are. I think a lot of, I think some, uh, I encountered somebody today who just felt talking about it. You mean, and it went from you mean, after I was talking about uh, building number seven, and it's, coming down, I never even heard about building number seven. And, I, you know, it was not in the 9-11 uh, Commission report at all. And so we talked for 20 minutes, and by the end of that, uh, he said, oh, my God. He had made that jump from denial or 
I think he sort of fell into at least three of those four categories, Barry, to deciding, you know, maybe I didn't have the truth. Maybe I need to, and I told him, you know, you can download things like Loose Change mm -hmm. uh, off Google. I, I believe 9-11 Revisited. I was telling him that's very good on building number seven. And so, oh my God, this is a moment of education and jumping over denial. And denial is created by a number of, yeah. in a number of ways, isn't it? And we'll be talking about those, won't we? Because I think the first reason we look at, we, uh, we reject 9-11 uh, truth because we don't like what we hear. We don't like it. Kevin Barrett in Truth Jihad, in a publisher's note, says, for millions of us, the facts are already painfully clear. The real problem is Kevin's facts are too hard for them. All the videos, and Barbara's just yeah. mentioned them, can be seen on Google, YouTube, um, and TrueTube. But if your argument is not liked, the publisher says, they dispute or ignore any facts you bring. It doesn't matter how true, then, the facts are or how they agree with other facts. If we don't like the facts, then they are rejected. Is that one of the reasons why our public may not be open to... Uh, Exploring 9/11. I think, so. and I'd like to, I'd just like to interject. I think one of the <clears throat> one of the factors that hasn't been mentioned is I've I've been in the news business since I was 17. When uh, a reporter, whether it's TV or print, uh, presents a story, everybody reads that, mm -hmm. and they accept what it is, even though you're just showing up on the scene trying to gather stuff, uh, and you put out what you can. And you don't have, uh, I think Katrina was a good example of, my gosh. And people began to just accept what they saw. And then they would go out, call up people. Do you know what I just saw? So you've got the first, the first impact of what's happened. You buy. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, this goes to, it feeds into denial. And so you don't like anything else that challenges it, right? Um, then the question really starts to begin to creep in on us. Well, what about things we should really not dislike that are seemingly liked by our culture? Do we like it when our government is a government of mentocracy or a government by lying? Why don't we respond with dislike to that? You know, Or we may not like what we've become in face of the facts, like looking in the mirror. Barrett says, endless discussions of how Bush and Cheney administration had blown up the Twin Towers and murdered thousands of Americans in order to turn the whole country into a drooling mob of homicidal Islamic idiots, or, as he is quoted again, turned the American people into such a bunch of bleeding, cowering morons. Do other country people, you know, from other countries see us that way? Well, we shouldn't like that, should I, re we? I remember, though, when Bush won, mm -hmm. the London Mirror, had, it's a tabloid, they had a picture of Bush, and their headline was, how come 59 million people can be so dumb? <laughs> well, I think in the end, do we like it that these madmen of power have the means to impose their own mental breakdowns on a whole nation? Goodness. Well, a second reason why our public may be you know, are rejecting 9-11 truth is because they don't want to be concerned about anything that doesn't affect them immediately. Yeah. I mean, we've got too much on our plate already, which excuses us from the larger issues of living that we don't have time for, energy for, more than one job, no job, overwhelming debt. Yeah. Goodness. This works the other way also, though. Even people who are at, in activist groups compartmentalize themselves away from 9-11 truth because it's not of immediate concern. Ooh. Do we meet people like that yeah, in the oh my movement? God. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> For example, when we try to march with anti-war activists, they won't even take a 9-11 DVD because it doesn't somehow measure up to the immediate mandate to get troops out of Iraq. How and under what circumstances did they get there in the first place except by 9-11? Yeah. 
Barry Zwicker says in Towers of Deception, when he had a um, conversation with a, t with a senior editor, and the editor said a number of times when he was trying to call attention to the truth of 9-11, I have better things to do. Hmm. I've never read books, looked at internet articles on 9-11. So 9-11 was a diversion from his immediate day's hmm. agenda. Yeah. Europeans and Asians have a much broader view of time than we do. Americans see the present as a slight line in the sand, and the future is all determining while they see the present as a series of concerns, that is, Asians and Europeans, as a series of concerns and consequences which need to be dealt with. The endless future opportunities for American people for the immediate future are running out, don't you think? We don't have endless future resources. We don't live in the future. Yeah. We live in the now. Yeah. Yeah. Audience question? Yeah. You have an audience question? Okay. So the great American trait is to find solutions for the problems rather than their cause. Do we know that? Yeah. <clears throat> many, many progressives in around us, they want to find solutions to the environment and everything, but they refuse to look at the cause, the linchpin yeah. of a lot of these issues as they're being lived out yeah, today. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on. We only want to look at the immediate symptoms of 9-11. We don't want to look at 9-11. So, anyway, a third reason is that we, re well, that we reject 9-11 truth is we're not curious, we're not searching, we're not questioning. Do you remember last time we had this program? Bill may remember we had a caller who called in about uh, looking at 9-11 um, Fahrenheit, wasn't that the Yeah, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So yeah. I went home and I looked up the website 9-11 Fahrenheit. And guess what? It said nothing about 9-11. It was all about debunking uh, yeah. Michael Moore yeah. and all that he's done yeah. in his movies, right? Nothing. So the person who called in with that question and accusation hadn't taken the time to be curious enough to even look it up yeah. himself. He just saw the word 9-11 and Fahrenheit, and he put together you know, some sort of debunking thing that he wanted to air on the program. And... Uh, it's a very clever use of words mm -hmm. because you look at those and you think it's Fahrenheit 9-11, right. but it isn't. How about the popular mechanics who have busied themselves at the paid bequests of the Bush administration with refuting 9-11 truth without either dealing with the prima facie evidence of 9-11 yeah. truth, presenting any of their own counter evidence, but popular mechanics is often quoted as the final authority debunking 9-11 truth, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not curious, not questioning, not searching. If you look like somebody in authority, no curiosity need be exercised in our country. In 1960, you remember the Hartford experiment where they took people upstairs yeah. to experiment on torture. People were taken off the street upstairs in a room filled with electronic equipment wired to a person sitting in a chair and electrodes to the equipment, and the person in charge told the solicited person to turn the dial indicating the voltage to the person in the chair and kept turning it up even beyond the yeah. point that was supposedly human tolerance. Yeah. And when the person turning the dial was asked why they complied, they said to that 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 person looked authoritative in their white coat. Yeah, you can do that with a clipboard, too. Walk around with a clipboard, and people will think you're an official. So do you think a, people yeah. in our audience uh, today maybe don't look at 9-11 because of the fact that they're not curious or maybe questioning? Is that a possibility? Well, they are, and I think, you know, you, you're hit on I th the main main things you can add to that. Uh, fear, mm -hmm. uh, social pressure. Are you kidding? Don't even, you're not invited to my potluck. I don't want to hear that stuff. Or, or uh, it's plain old ignorance, as you're really hitting on here. Uh, there's also, uh, Americans are trusting. They trust their government. Uh, how, I mean, I can remember one guy coming at me 
who were out there demonstrating, and he said, you mean to tell me our government would do such a thing? And his face was, and I know underneath that fury is always fear, fear, and say it ain't so, and, and he would have to do all of that. But there's also, uh, uh, somebody's talked about laziness. And it's not, you know, we, people are working two jobs, maybe three jobs and, and whatnot, but uh, I don't know, I don't want to, I want to watch something else or, I, you know, that's too heavy. Uh, uh, it's the old university thing. You know, I think I'll go down and have a cup of coffee. Question? Uh, and I'll come back. Question? And then I'll look into it. You know, and God, I mean, I'm looking at this book, and you got three of them here. No, nah, why don't you just give me the Reader's Digest uh, uh, version? And I saw one, too. There's a, there's a fellow in Minneapolis who's very heavily involved in impeachment. And uh, across, uh, uh, he, he posted uh, in the middle of an impeachment that were plans that are going on, probably the best digest I've seen of most of the things that we say. And I, I, that we know or that we're expanding mm -hmm. our uh, eyes on. Yeah. Uh, and people would like that Reader's Digest version. And they probably, I mean, that's one thing that sometimes we don't, it takes a lot of work. I'm, you know, watching uh, the uh, prelude here that Bill put on, uh, I didn't know that thermite, for example, can be sprayed. I, I, once I leaped over my denial about what happened on 9-11, then the doors opened. It's like you expand and you get the freedom of looking. That's what our movement yeah. is all about, yeah. trying it's, to it's, yeah. open people. We have a questioner from our audience. Yeah, I have a question about the Pentagon. You, you always hear photographs don't lie. And um, we've seen the Pentagon photographed from every angle possible that morning, and there just isn't a normal plane crash type of photography there. What has been your reaction showing people those photos and how the, the hole is only 16 feet across? And perfectly round, and that doesn't fit with a, an aircraft of 125 feet wingspan. So, what has been your uh, response showing people those photographs? And a 42 foot tail that suddenly isn't there or has no effect on the building. Yeah, or the or the lights, the light poles. Are we Somehow. so <laughs> in curious, uncurious? I should say that we don't even ask questions about that, even though we were shown those pictures, weren't we? And uh, the lack of bodies and uh, airplane debris and luggage. Right. And all we've all seen horrible plane crashes, and the, the photography just isn't there to support it. And there's no burned lawn. No. Yeah. And the spools in front of the building were not affected by yeah. the plane. There's no engines digging into the ground that would have had to have happened where the body of the plane to hit where they said it did. What about the other 84 videotapes that were taken of that? What happened to them? Yeah, I think there's just yeah. a lot of questions we don't have answered. Yeah. Phone calls. Okay. Hmm? Phone calls. Okay. Phone caller? Yes, hi. Can you guys, am I on? Yes. Hi, my name is Barrett, and uh, I'm an activist and a constitutionalist. Uh, I have a question. Um, insurance companies don't like to pay. They don't like to pay out. Look at Katrina. Anyway, the guy that owned the World Trade Center bought the insurance policy at, what was it, a month before 9-11? And uh, with the Building 7 and all this, uh, you know, these insurance companies, they'd be looking into it. My question is, is, is didn't they, what insurance company was it? Does anybody know? And, and did they do an investigation? And if so, it must not have been a very good one or we just didn't get one. any news yeah, on it. A good source, Steve. That's my question. Thank uh, you, Carl. So that's, that that's, a, that's a good question. And a lot of, uh, 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 we're talking about Larry Silverstein, uh, who was a wheeler dealer in real estate. Now, he owned building number seven, uh, what, the, what the, uh, the owners of the property, that's the Port Authority of New Jersey and New York. They uh, were finding that tenants were dropping, tenancy was dropping in the, tw in the towers. They, uh, they had a big problem with asbestos. They had a big problem with the cladding that everybody saw. They had the crosses like the, ready to fall. Uh, the city of New York refused twice on the Port Authority <clears throat> to issue a demo demolition permit because the buildings were built on municipal bonds and uh, the bondholders were not about to stand that. And also there were tourist attractions. But nevertheless, Silverstein, you're quite right, 
uh, got the lease of the rest of the property. The property, the land is owned by the port authorities. But the building, they, they, they decided, I think, uh, that if he owned the lease, go before the city council once again and apply for a permit. Because when you're a leaseholder, you do all the problems, the maintenance, etc. He got possession of that building. <clears throat> he won the bid for $3.2 million. Billion, uh, and his backers, he had many to put that package of $3.2 billion. And given the fact that the World Trade, the building number one had had a bomb back in 93, all those backers said, you will insure that building for $3.5 billion. And so you had, the premiums had to be enormous. <clears throat> so this was his uh, uh, group of backers. Okay, when the attack came, the building number seven was insured by Alliance of Munich. And uh, they, they took the FEMA report, which said, we don't know what the cause was. I'm just sort of, uh, <clears throat> and so they paid off almost immediately. Uh, what Silverstein did with the payoff on that uh, <clears throat> was to pay off all those people who put in money. So he put in 14 million himself, but uh, $3.2 billion is a lot of money to get the lease here. But um, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, fact is he did take possession. There was a, there's a lot of other stuff that went on before that. If you, if you look into the financial side of how he came to have the lease of the complex itself, you begin, to, there's a, I mean, uh, somebody tried to kill him. Uh, I mean, there's a whole drama about it. But a good question, good question, thank you. Next caller. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, basically, can you hear me? I hear a buzzing. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, I, I turned, Go ahead. I turned up the volume. But anyway, uh, long story short, is that um, just recently uh, the anthrax scientist or investigator mm -hmm. committed suicide. I'm sure you heard about that recently. Mm -hmm. It brings questions as all these people that disappear with possibility of uh, some information that who knows what it could possibly be. Uh, just a lot of questions about what goes on with the government. <clears throat> but then again, we also have terrorists at the same time. So uh, the confusion as to, you know, when is it really the terrorists? When is it the government? Mm -hmm. And then we also see instances where the people that are the terrorists are receiving arms from the government. So it almost seems like a handshaking back and forth keeping himself mm -hmm. in the business of war. Who knows? To it's so complex. It's so confusing. And, and like Noriega, for instance, we look back in history, we see a lot of instances where the drug wars and the U.S. government being involved in those things. At the same time, they're fighting against wars. I mean, it's just such a conglomeration of, um, of a massive mess. And my biggest concern is a nuclear war as a test, just like we had this, Will there be a nuclear war to see what happens if there's a nuclear to, war? Is the caller really questioning uh, maybe the being very suspicious and curious, right? That maybe this was another story that we should be very curious about. Yeah. Not being the way the media is presenting it to us, is it? Maybe this guy wasn't just committing suicide. Maybe he was blowing the whistle. Maybe he was the guy who was going to say some things that they didn't want him to say. So maybe his death is not a suicide at all. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, Al, you got it on the, you hit the yeah. nail on the head. I mean, again, uh, the gentleman sitting next to you said, when the media presents something, we listen to what the media tells us. Right off the bat, we believe what the media just stated. Right. And what you said is a very good question. So, thank you very much for your call. Yeah. Listen. Uh, there's one more. Got one more call coming in. Go ahead, caller. Okay. Hey, um, that guy was so right on. I can't even believe it. Um, this is Jan, and, you know, I love this show, and I just, my um, heart is hurting because I have That's paid Jan. dearly for knowing the truth and not being able to get it out to have people accept it like you were talking about in the beginning. I mean, my family thinks I'm crazy. 
I had signs out, um, like, immediately when I woke up. And, I mean, I faced a lot of ridicule. I don't even get to watch my two youngest granddaughters because they think I'm nuts. And that's their way of denying it. Now, I've had a lot of time to wonder, and this thing has been planned for so long, and what that previous caller was talking about is like, yeah, this thing is huge. And I think they dumbed the population down and did a lot of things like Ruby Ridge and um, the Waco Mm -hmm. and the uh, Oklahoma City. And uh, they were doing something to the psyche of this country. They're already taking away critical thinking in the schools that there can't be that many stupid people in the world. And I didn't raise stupid children. And I have seriously been wounded for being in reality about how bad this thing really is and how scary it is. Well, Jan, uh, let's turn it around a little bit. I think your name is Jan, isn't it? You yeah. called last week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's turn it around. And one of the reasons why we reject 9-11 truth is because we are insane, not the people that believe in 9-11, you know, 9-11 truth, but rather it's more correct to say that people who deny the evidence of 9-11 are insane. In fact, uh, Matthias Brokers, who is a German, writing uh, this particular book down here that I'm referring to, says that uh, that basically using the definition of insane means to prematurely cut off our thinking, something that Barbara was referring to a minute mm-hmm. ago. Clinging ferociously, he says, to a preconceived paradigm, even in the teeth of overwhelming evidence against it. I think our audience uh, was referring to that a minute ago, even in in the teeth of evidence that there wasn't even enough room in that hole in the Pentagon to get a plane, a 757 in there. We somehow act insane by closing down and just giving up. Our insanity really is about closing our minds. And so Barrett says, anyone who denies that anything he doesn't already know could possibly exist is asserting he already knows everything that could possibly be known. Such people are the epistemological equivalent of the legion of lunatics, he says, who think they are world bestriding Napoleons. I'd like like to put in something else, Uh, Jan, is it? Uh, uh, The analogy is the family drunk. Kids don't talk about it, uh, and and we don't. He doesn't have a problem. Uh, we are just the police. We're here to see about something else, and uh, and terrible things are going in, on in the house. I think there's not a family in this country that doesn't know denial, and fortunately today uh, it is not such a shameful thing to go for some help. Uh, uh, they do things like confrontations. Maybe the family will all show up at Al-Anon. We need to know what to do here. And stand off society that says, you have married a loser, and he is, or she, and we don't talk too much about the she, uh, but they deny. I was telling Barry, I have a relative who, uh, he was near death in Montana from booze, and they brought him all the way to Wisconsin, put him up under the attic, uh, and he was in late stage alcoholism. And nobody, the neighbors didn't even know this guy was in the house for two years, and he died up there. There was some problem with the undertaker. Uh, hmm. Fortunately, the family is uh, undertakers. Wow. But it is denial, uh, right. because you don't, society is going to really put the screws on you if you speak up uh, yes. against something that's a moral situation. And so. along that same line, <clears throat> we are in one huge dysfunctional family, and we are the scapegoats because we're pointing to the problem because right. the real drunk is the powers that be that's and right. that's what they don't want to face and they'll be busy scapegoating us <clears throat> to take the heat off the elephant in the living room that's uh very good it's very so, good thank Sweet. you for this show thank you jan bye do we have another call coming in okay Okay. Uh, there's got to be room for 
rigorous uncertainty. And according to Brokers and Barrett, we need to live in the no man's land, in other words, to be sane, between critical thought and pathological paranoia with this rigorous sense of uncertainty. And if we don't do that, we can consider ourselves, as Webster Tarpley calls it, living in collective schizophrenia. Mm. So then there's the whole matter of the fact that we're brainwired to make up stories counting, countering 9-11 <clears throat> truth. Steven Pinker's in How the Mind Works is quoted by Barry Zwicker. The conscious mind is a spin doctor, not the commander in chief. <laughs> so if you, you're presented some evidence like Building 7 came down because of diesel fuel, man, you could douse all of Building 7 with diesel fuel and light it on fire, and it still wouldn't come down. Yeah. So somebody is not using their brain. There's a part of the brain which is a spin doctor and what Barrett calls the baloney generator. That's very good. And it's that that, you know, um, Zwicker talks about being at a conference in 2005, and he says there was this five-person con uh, conference, and one of the members was an ex-Star Wars humix, and he was presenting a, you know, a binder of evidence, and they had invited this woman architect who's about 40 years old, a very nice woman, they, he said, but when Humix presented this, one side presented the Madrid fire, yeah. and the other side was WTC. And so the woman was asked by Zwicker, why didn't this building fall down when these did? And she says, because it was fireproofed. <laughs> and Zwicker says, wait a minute, you just made that up. And she said, well, yes. And it was a great example to him of how the brain makes up stories, you know, when it comes to especially important things like 9-11. Well, I think that's because they also... Okay, we're going to roll a video now okay. by Barry Zwicker. And uh... think of these uh, phrases as just words or just bits of ink on paper or some vocalization. It's more justified to think of the words as bullets and the phrases as bombs that go off inside our heads and destroy thought. Conspiracist and its deadly duplicates are such dependable weapons that the dark practitioners of psychological warfare fire them again and again. In this post 9-11 world, there's a phrase that could be uh, analyzed at length. Featuring the omnipresent war on terror, a war on a noun, it's important to understand who's doing the firing to deconstruct this weapon and reveal its mechanisms so as to combat it more effectively. This is at least as important as learning how a cruise missile works or a spy satellite or an election campaign. Now, who uses the phrase? And how many variations are there of this weapon? It may surprise you that most of the leading trigger men are well-known leftist intellectuals. All the following words and phrases have been used at least once by these people, Noam Chomsky, Gwyn Dyer, George Monbiot and Alexander Coburn in books, columns, speeches, and in publications such as Coburn's uh, publication, which I subscribe to, Counterpunch. Now, the root put down phrase. Conspiracy theory is, and keep in mind, these are actually, I've copied these directly from uh, transcripts and articles and books by these, just these four gatekeepers of the left. Conspiracy theory is a concatenation of ill-attested nonsense, crazy distraction, an ocean of nonsense, like the millenar millenarian fantasies, always open-ended as two numbers, an epidemic of gibberish, back in much more virulent form, fantasies, 
fundamental idiocy, political infantilism, pure paranoid fantasy, rotting people's brains, rubbish, rumor and confusion, the summa of all foolishness. I love that one. Wild supposition raised to the status of incontrovertible fact. There's a lot of projection going on among the gatekeepers of the left. So that's the root put down phrase. Now, how's it used? Here's the primary assault. Conspiracists are insane. That's the primary assault. They are. That's us, by the way. Keep in mind. You know who you are. Actually, that's the way a, a, an article in The Nation by, by David Korn began about us. You know who you are. I thought it was very clever. You are. We are. I am. Conspiracy idiots, gibbering idiots, idiots, immune to reality check, kooks, lunatics, mad inquisitors, mad. This is us. There, there's, there we are in Toronto at a 9-11 Truth uh, event in front of the CBC. Yeah, we're the lunatics. Oh, here's more of us. Holy mackerel. So many madmen on the loose. But it's, that's, that's not the end of the list. Conspiracists are, are, conspiracists are insane. They are members of the grassy knoll society. You'll see the Globe and Mail writer worked that into yesterday's Globe and Mail. Morons, nuts, nutty, paranoid, possessed by this sickness, eyes rolling, lips flecked with foam. <laughs> that, 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 you know, that's from Gwyn Dyer. Gwyn Dyer, uh, and, uh, a column published in 42 countries. Tin hat wearers. Oh, there's a cat with a tin hat. Also, there's somebody here with a baseball cap that's covered with tin, and I signed it yesterday, and if the guy's still here, I want to get my picture taken with him. <laughs> now, the secondary assault, kinder, kinder and gentler department. Conspiracists need therapy. Ah. Uh, they believe in magic over common sense, or even reason. They disdain the real world have a deep desire for an all-knowing father. <laughs> have a need for order and design. Well, I will admit to that. I mean, I could use some more, as you can tell. <laughs> they need to believe in conspiracies. Believing in conspiracies makes the world easier for them. And I'm sure you all agree. It's so much easier, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy, that really makes the world... That makes my day. Yeah, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing with my life than this. Sure, sure, sure. Anyway, here we are. These are us. These are the people needing therapy. Notice how depressed they all look. See, see look, look at them. They, they look so depressed. They really need therapy. And look at, there's Carol Bruyere in San Francisco. My God, isn't she down in the dumps? She really needs a psychiatrist or somebody from Counterpunch to straighten her out. Now, the tertiary assault, I call it the sneaky redirect department. And I, if you don't know what that means, well, I...